And welcome to the Supernatural Fandom Track at Continual. I'm your host, Gail Z. Martin, and today we're going to be talking about fan works and why fandom needs and grows from the fan works, the fan fiction, the fan art, the fan videos, the cosplay, all those wonderful things that fans create out of their love for the show. And with me today, I've got a couple of great guests. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Go ahead, Tanya. Hi, I'm Tanya Cook, and I am a sociology professor, and I research fandom, uh, especially supernatural and fandom-based charity work, and I also really enjoy fan works. April? Hey, I'm April Vian. I am a behavior therapist, and I'm a writer. I've written um, Conventional Wisdom, which is a fan work of itself, a book about these supernatural conventions. And I'm Gail Z. Martin. I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, steampunk, and more. And as Morgan Bryce, I write urban fantasy, male male paranormal romance. And as I've told my story in uh, Lindsay Burness's There'll Be Peace When You Are Done, the way I ended up coming to add a whole new section of writing to my professional career was because I fell in love with supernatural fan fiction. Um, I had, I, fan fiction taught me how to write when I was in high school and college, taught me I could entertain a, an audience, and then I drifted away from it for many years. And once I fell in love with Supernatural and the show went on hiatus, I did something I hadn't done in, in decades, and that was go and find fan fiction, which now with the internet is marvelous and so much different than the early days, and fell in love with the case fiction decided I would take a look at this slash stuff, fell in love with it, came back up, read uh, some of the non-fandom published male male romance and said, this is too much fun, I've got to get in on it. And that launched an entire new pen name and set of novels for me. So when we're talking about the impact fan works can have on a person, it can be anywhere from being part of your, um, your way to pass a pleasant evening to changing your life. And I think that's kind of what we're really getting at today when we talk about it. Let's start with um, defining what fan works uh, means. And, and it's also often called transformative works. Tanya, what does that mean when you hear those words? Yeah, thank you. I was thinking about this and I'm gonna give you a really long and sociology professor-ish answers a little bit, but <laughs> um, I think it, Basically, it's just uh, works that are inspired by uh, an original work of some kind. So it's, uh, it can be writing, it can be art, it can be, as we were saying earlier, cosplay, um, fan vids, right? Anything that fans do, not necessarily, not, not the profit issue is, is a, adjacent to that, but I wouldn't say it has to do with making money. It's more about expressing your love for, for some product or wanting to explore something in more depth or um, wanting to fix something that you perceive as being uh, an issue or continuing this story. So it's the, the longer answer is I was thinking about this as I think it's even in this day and age, it's harder to separate those boundaries of what is and what isn't essentially a fan work or a transformative work because even if you think about if you want to go to this level and I'm not a literature person but supernatural itself is a bit of a fan work I mean Kripke the creator has said that Dean and Sam were modeled after Han and Luke from Star Wars you know obviously the being in the car and on the road is very Jack Kerouac and referencing that and the monster stories um and the, the hunts themselves are influenced by a variety of world um, and cultural mythologies. So in any television show, right, is going to be um, predicated on what has come before. So I find it, as a sociologist, I always am looking at boundaries and how we decide what is something and what is something else. And that sounds really abstract, but basically 
you know, what, what is different between a professional product like Supernatural from being called a fan work versus something someone writes as a fic? Um, and I think really it's about who has sort of copyright and claim to those characters um, and who doesn't. And we could get into gender politics and other kinds of status politics there. So I didn't mean to like make the issue more complicated, but I find that question really, really interesting. Um, so there you go. That's a lot. <laughs> well, I think you bring up a, a really great point, which is that transformative works are nothing new. If you look at classical art, the artists all trained by working with a currently great artist and copying their actual paintings and then moved off to do their own original work. And we've seen a lot of people graduate from graduate, quote unquote, if they wanted to do that from um, fan fiction to professional and completely original fiction. And I've heard somebody say that Milton's Paradise Lost was really a fan fiction of Genesis and Dante's Inferno was a fan fiction of Catholic dogma. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, it's been around for a long, long time. April, what about you? What, is, what does the idea of fan works or transformative works mean for you? Probably not as um, eloquent as what Tanya <laughs> said. A little more basic for me. Um, so I think of it more as the transformative arts that we were talking about, um, art, um, books, writing, fanfic. Um, I've heard music at some of the conventions. I know there's at least one artist who's written songs about the show. I would even go as far as to say you see it in some of the photo ops at the conventions where people kind of recreate scenes or try to kind of create their own scene that they can get a picture of. Um, it's kind of anything that's inspired by the show that makes you want to make art or make a change in the world. In the, you know, stepping outside the supernatural fandom, in the genre fiction fandom, something is, has been around for a very long time called Filk. Um, and that is musicians doing parodies of songs with fandom elements in them. And uh, the, the name for that actually is inspired by a typo many, many years ago on a, on a, a <laughs> convention program. It was supposed to be folk music and they wrote folk music and they said, well, we'll just fit. Um, but yeah, that tradition, I, I haven't run into that in Supernatural, but in a sense, we see that with the music videos. There are a ton of music videos where people who have mad editing skills and more free time than I can imagine, <laughs> put these masterpieces together with all of these clips from throughout the show to do an homage to the show, to capture a moment in time or a feeling. And I think for me, one of the things is certainly having written fan fiction as a, as a teenager and a 20 something, it was certainly a, a sandbox and a way for me to learn how to write. Back then we didn't have the ability to share it on the internet and get that kind of community and feedback. We, the only time you got to read it was at a convention and you were passing physical copies around a room. Now with that feedback that people can get on sites like AO3, which won a Hugo last year, a Hugo Award for Transformative Works, which is huge, uh, people also get that sense of community and whether they want to eventually write for publication or whether they are just very happy writing for their network of fans. There's all, it's all good. There, there's this wonderful range there. And I think that brings a lot of people out of their shells and helps them explore some of these abilities. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to share kind of you know, more abstract and more personal things um, with respect to that. But yeah, I think with, with respect to your question or your comment about Filk, though, I would I immediately thought of the Hillywood uh, videos. You know, that's fan fiction, if you will, or fan, not fan fiction, fan work, right? If you think about those, and they're, they're amazing, of course, because they've been able to level up and they're both intensely talented, um, right? Uh, so that's, that's fascinating. But it, yes, absolutely. I started reading fan fiction. I think I had read some many years ago and just found it interesting, but didn't really like fall into it. Um, and then I wanted to look at it because a lot of the 
academic studies of fandom look at fan fiction. And so having read Lynn and Kathy's book, uh, Fandom at the Crossroads, and their, their argument about fan fiction as a sort of group therapy, I thought that was really fascinating. So I started reading more. And then I started um, writing some myself and just, just to kind of get my, me, me out of writer's block, if you will, and to sort of explore what I usually write nonfiction. So trying to write some fiction and kind of jumping into, to, you know, a world that's already somewhat constructed. It's almost like I, I am not a gamer, but if you think about like jumping into a game, there's rules that are already there. There's characters. I'm thinking of clue because we just played that last <laughs> week. Right. You know, but how you interpret that and what you do with those and the decisions that you make, right. That is, that is um, organic to how, the interaction is happening. And of course, that's fascinating for me. And then very personal note, I am about a week from my two weeks, uh, two, no, sorry, two year celebration of, of not drinking alcohol. And I use fan fiction to, um, yeah, to kind of distract myself <laughs> when I would get to that time of day where I would be like ready to have, you know, to have a drink, I would start writing. And I, I use that very intentionally um, as a kind of distraction slash coping mechanism because I realized I wasn't drinking because I wanted the alcohol. I was drinking because I have OCD and I wanted to manage the anxiety. Um, so instead, if I change that pathway and then I put the OCD stuff into one of the stories. So I very much took uh, literal and figurative inspiration from, from some of the academic things I was reading to help myself with that. Well, and I think we've seen that in the focusing specifically on the fan fiction right now. There's such a wide range. There's the case stick that is just like another episode that has no romantic elements, no pairings of any kind, no shipping. It's just, let's work this case. Hey, here's a cool story. And then there are, of course, the, the shipping, the, the romance ones. Um, and, but they usually have a case element as well, if they're of any, any length. And then you've got the ones where maybe they're curtain fixed, so it's kind of how people think the, the series is going to end. But interspersed through all of those are what I think of as coping fic, where one of the boys has a chronic serious illness. Uh, one of the boys gets permanently injured and has to deal with being in a wheelchair or blindness or loss of function in some way. And I know some of those authors are writing through their own coping with that condition. And that I, I know from my own fiction, you end up writing a lot into your stories as you're dealing with it that you're not even aware you're writing into your stories. And then there are the ones you write just to keep a grip on, you know, reality. And I think fan fiction is a wonderful place for people to do that with the characters that they love and trust and feel safe with. What are your thoughts, April? Yeah, um, I really completely agree with that from a, a more psychological mental health perspective. Um, it's definitely, writing in itself can be a coping skill. Writing about something that you feel comfortable and safe and well-versed in is a very different experience. I've talked with a lot of people about how um, kind of being in the fandom allows you to operate from a safer space than a lot of people have from home. And that's true in in writing and art and just kind of in life in general, learning how to navigate relationships and kind of social expectations that we might not feel comfortable navigating independently. Doing it in this world, whether it's through writing or online through the fandom is a much safer and a very different experience for our people. I know for myself personally, and I've written about this several times, I had a lot of, um, a lot of anxiety and mental health struggles coming in to the fandom and I had stopped writing for a long time because it just seemed like it was a waste of time and it wasn't something that I was ever going to get paid to do and I had kids and I had to go be a grown-up and I started writing conventional wisdom because I didn't really have much of a choice it just kind of started happening and it came together very quickly and that inspired me to try to write fiction and I did start with um not that I'll ever show it to anybody, but I did start with fan fiction with the characters that I was familiar with. And that's kind of 
um, kind of snowballed over the last two years. I've published a couple of fiction books now, and I started um, taking some side work as like a freelance writer. And three years ago, before I had tried to write for Supernatural or write fanfic, I wouldn't have thought that this was the thing I could do. I was actually writing, reading something I wrote right after the first convention where I was saying I wanted to be involved in things like this and was that a crazy thing to think that I could like write anything that anybody would want to read or be involved in that way. It, it well, provides us opportunities. And I and just to um, let folks who are who are kind of tuning in on this know April and Melissa Smith Kennedy are the authors of Conventional Wisdom, which is a book all about the impact supernatural cons uh, have had on the people who attend them. And then the other book that, uh, oh, she's got visual aids. This is great. Mine are right there, so I can't really hold it up. Tanya's and in the book too, yeah. <laughs> the other books that uh, Tanya mentioned are by Lynn Subernus and uh, Kathy Sullivan. Did I get uh, that right? Larson. Larson. Uh, and that is Phantom at the Crossroads, which is a more academic approach, and Supernatural Fangirls. And uh, we have... Uh, video conversation and well of course there's there'll be peace when you are done we're just going to pimp Lynn at the moment for a moment yeah. but, I'll just empty are, my books out <laughs> which are uh, books written by the cast crew and fans about the impact Supernatural's had on their life and the legacy of Supernatural and you'll be able to see video interviews with Lynn and other folks about those books here on Continual but I just wanted, since we kind of made an abbreviated, oh, everybody knows what we're talking about reference, I wanted to make sure everybody <laughs> knew what we're talking about. And, you know, you bring up something interesting with the cons, because while in Supernatural fandom, they're mostly run by Creation Entertainment, which is a very professional convention running organization. In a lot of fandoms, whatever conventions happen, happened because of fan volunteers who bring it about and they may not get the big stars or they might uh back in the day that was the only kind of convention that there was because nobody was making any money whatsoever <laughs> from it um but the convention still CouchCon popped up during the <laughs> lockdown and all of a sudden we had three days of <laughs> online programming that seemed to spring from nowhere and many of the uh, many of the actors and actresses dropped in on zoom because nobody could leave the house so what else was anybody doing and so we still have some of that and I, I see that as a fan work as well because it's something that people pull together out of the love for the show and the love for the fandom nobody's making any money off of it <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And with um, CouchCon, I think was a great example of that because that did start off as just um, a, a comment on Facebook between a friend of mine and a couple other people. And before we knew it, there were a thousand people coming and Osric Chow joined the group and asked if he could do a panel. And we didn't reach out to him. He was bored on his couch too and found us. And that inspired people. They, we had all sorts of people donate things. They made t-shirts, they made pins, they made stickers. They donated their own fan works that they've done for raffles and auctions. All of it benefited um, Random Max, Misha Collins' charity for anybody who doesn't know. But it, it was a, a great example of the fandom and of the fandom works. They took their kind of collective talent and connections and all came together for no benefit of themselves really just to to remind everybody what the fandom's capable of. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was wonderful. I didn't get to hang out as much as I wanted to, but I thought it was it was just this fantastic, spontaneous love fest. <laughs> and and that's what a lot of, of fan works really come from is that love. Um, you know, you mentioned fixing things. I, I often think of fan fiction particularly is women explaining the show where <laughs> yeah what they really meant to say was and then we have and, or patching up those holes in the canon uh compliance that somehow got skipped and going okay what really should have happened so 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I've said this, I think I said this to Lynn at one point. I said, you know, this is like when you played Barbies as a kid and you, you would act out various scenarios with the Barbie dolls or whatever, maybe, or for me, I had like my little ponies and, and everything. And I realized I used to lay in bed at night as like an eight-year-old kid thinking about what Indiana Jones was doing, you know, like what, what's he up to? What's going on? Like what else? I'm going to make that movie continue, you know? So if you've ever had that impulse of well, what happened after that movie, well, what happened after that episode, you, you are writing or, or engaging in fan work, essentially, you know, you're basically saying what, what would happen if this happened? Right. And so I love, um, I really like, I'm not necessarily a person that needs plot fixes usually, Sometimes, um, but I like AUs. I don't know why, but usually I think they're so creative. AU is um, alternate universe. So it's where you take those, those characters and like just put them in a normal setting or just a completely different setting. And I find that really creative and interesting um, personally. So I, uh, when you kind of mash up those genres, but the characters are still very much in character uh, I like that. When we get out of character, you know, you can do a lot with them. But for me, when we when we leave the sort of boundaries of how I think of that person, I that that's where I lose my um, believability in the wherever I'm at in the story. Um, but I don't know if you want to talk about specific works. There's a couple I've read this year uh, of supernatural fic that I've just thought were brilliant and just i i feel like one of the ones i'm reading the author is just a genius and or i don't know they must have put just an immense amount of research into this and it's the goofiest premise but it works somehow and it's very serious and i'm like emotionally con committed to the original characters that they've written um anyway so it's well, it's yeah it's interesting because when you're talking about some of those alternate universes to me, I'm watching that and going, okay, this is the evolution of an author. Whether or not they ever decide to be published, they start in the sandbox where it's someone else's setting and characters, so all you have to do is come up with the plot. And then they start to change either the setting or the characters, and then they change both. And now you've got something that is basically head casted with Jensen and Jared playing the roles, but they're no longer Sam and Dean. This is no longer the supernatural world. And at that point, we joke about filing the VIN numbers off it and making it an original work, meaning to take out any of the intellectual property that isn't original. But at that point, the author really has evolved into writing original fiction. They've taken the training wheels off, which were all the fandom pieces. And I can think of several, I won't name them here, but I can think of several authors and series that have come directly from that. And if you know the show, you can see that and go, I know what you did here. And that's perfectly okay, because at this point it's all their original stuff, but you can see the influences. And some people choose to go published with that. Some people stay fandom based and, and that's entirely wonderful. However, people want to do it. There's so just to, I'm going to let April speak, but just to add to that, I got into some of this fantasy um, reading and, and just fandom in general by reading um, the Dragonlance books by mm -hmm. Weiss and Hickman. And that's, I believe, comes out of them playing Dungeons and Dragons. So it's them taking whatever they started doing in Dungeons and Dragons and then going, oh, this is cool. We should write this as and a I, story. I believe they actually started as sanctioned tie-in books. Mm hmm and yep. of course, tie-in books, and we've had this conversation, you know, with some of the tie-in authors who've been on um, my Supernatural Team Free Will NC group, tie-in is the official fan fiction because it's when the franchise itself hires someone and pays them to write a book about the show that doesn't happen in the show. So it becomes non-canon canon. It's official, but it never gets referenced in the show. And I, I believe Weiss and Hickman start, um, I, I believe that series is actually a tie-in. Um, and there's a lot of stuff out there in tie-in fiction, which is the professional and traditionally almost exclusively male. So 
when you mentioned the gender aspect, fan fiction has predominantly been written by female fans. And that's been part of the bonding and part of the blowback we get about fan fiction from the outside world. April, I wanted to come back to you because we just kind of got going there. Like, no, we can't. Fine. <laughs> you guys are much more well versed in that than I am. So that's absolutely fine. I don't actually read a ton of, um, of fan fiction. I have my favorites. I think, like, everybody does. And I kind of agree with Tanya, where I, I like to see the characters stay kind of who they have been once they get out of those roles. Like, I'm totally okay with alternate universes, different timelines, that kind of thing, but I need to see that they're still the characters. I don't mind reading other fiction, but I kind of need to be prepared that I'm not, I'm no longer reading supernatural fiction. I'm reading now the evolution of the author, like you said, where it's maybe some Sam and Dean kind of influence, but it's the same as the Han and Luke influence we see in Sam and Dean, where it's not the same story anymore. Yeah, I mean, my, my personal favorites are Case Thick and, and Curtain Thick, which is alternate endings for the series, and then um, some of the, the romance thick, which is also very case-centered. So, yeah, I've got plenty of favorites out there, too. <laughs> uh, we've talked a lot about fan fiction, and I think that's one of the things people think of first when we say transformative works. But there's also fan art and fan video and cosplay, all of which kind of fall under this transformative work. Where does that come into the impact on the fandom? How, do, how does it all tie together um, in terms of what it means for the creators and what it means for the people who, who consume that art and video and um, Let's talk a little bit about that, that kind of two-way relationship. I think the, um, the conventions are a good place to start with that. If you take the fan works and the art out of the conventions, you have a very empty vendor room and a lot of um, kind of dead time in between panels because that's really what that is now. There's been contests, there's auctions for art that benefit different charities while you're there. There's a lot of original fan art, including books and paintings and stuff in the vendor room. Um, and some of it's amazing, some of the artwork that can be done. There's comic books and just like all manner of things that really, um, I think it does kind of bring the fandom together because it allows your interest to kind of be seen and allows you to trans to express it in your own way. Maybe you can't write fanfic, but you can paint or you can take pictures. The photographers in the fandom are another. I think we've really talked about that, but mm -hmm. that alone has been pretty impressive with just the pictures that they've managed to take. And oh yeah, and that's such a piece of everyday fandom because those pictures from the conventions and those folks who have been there in the first couple of rows with their mega cameras, we share those photos back and forth on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and everybody's looking for, oh, I haven't seen that one before. And that, that really is a day-to-day -day piece of the fandom are those photos, as well as amazing. amazing artwork out there. And I think it's really democratizing. Like you mentioned um, videos and I was, and those photos, like for folks, um, for whom attending a convention or at least sitting in the front row is cost prohibitive, which is me. <laughs> you know, I can look at these amazing photos and people usually share them, you know, as long as they get credit, you should be giving credit. And there are norms around this just for folks who uh, are new to this. <laughs> we go all day about those. Um, but I was thinking about Alana King's channel, right? And um, which is, which are wonderful. I'm not wonderful at like keeping up with YouTube, but I've watched a few. And, you know, what she's really doing, and then she ended up getting, I think, partnering with Creation at some point, but what she's really doing is bringing um, nuances of the convention experience to a bigger audience who either maybe can't access it or want to learn about it before they experience it, because it is, it can be really overwhelming. And I've seen a lot of people talk about how they watched her videos to prepare for what this is going to be like, to understand you know, what, what, what is there? What can I do at the convention and et cetera? So, it, and she goes far beyond that on her channel, but 
I think that's really democratizing those those types of fan art fan works. Which really reminded me of a, a category we didn't mention, which is podcasts as fan art, because again, most of these are people who are or or fan sites, uh, Fangasm's website that has all the analysis of the shows and Winchester Family Business, which is uh, a, a treasure trove of information and reviews and think pieces. And it, it just goes, that, that's a rabbit hole if you need or one. Super wiki, right? Like that's, yeah. <laughs> I look at that when I'm writing, like probably even when I wrote for for April's book, like, oh, wait, what happened in that? You know, I've seen the show a couple of times, some episodes 10 times, but even the show has said, the actual producers have said, we look at Super Wiki because we need to remember <laughs> what the heck that was. I mean, it's, there's just, it's been on forever. <laughs> well, and Super Wiki's great. If you know they just made a pop culture reference, but you didn't get it, mm -hmm. Super Wiki usually has that explained for those, you know, who missed it or or so supernatural wiki i think it is sorry i was saying the wrong yeah um but mm -hmm. the podcasts that i'm really just now discovering like alana's and even some of the cast rihanna and and kim uh have their own wayward uh daughters podcast and this is all a step off what's canon but it's talking about the show and its offshoots and all those many tendrils and so it's content that springs from the inspiration of the show and now you've even got the cast doing it so what about what it means we've talked a little bit about what it means to the people who create it and the people who read it or buy the art or participate in the conventions but we've also really seen particularly in supernatural's case having that the fan works have a reciprocal impact on the, the show itself, on the creators of the show, on the franchise, and the cast and crew. And that's something, as someone who's been involved in fandom for most of my life, that's something unique with supernatural fandoms that we haven't seen in other groups. So let's talk a little bit about that, that acknowledgement that we're really not secret and that they know what we're doing <laughs> and that they keep sending us official canon nods that they see what we're doing and just to kick it off i think one of those first ones comes early in the show when sam and dean discover the books by carver edlund and they're sitting around talking they're looking it up and they're trying to figure out sam girls and dean girls and then dean asks his face faith, faithful question what's slash <laughs> and they get an answer and of yeah. course or says that the first the first fan fiction went up within like 20 minutes of the first episode and it was slash. <laughs> so i don't know whether that's true but it makes a great story let's look at me i can't talk on video without my hands let's talk about that um Tanya? yeah i this is great i i wish i had like <laughs> looked through and, and thought about specific examples but um for me absolutely what you're what you're referencing the meta the meta humor right the the you're thinking about some of the most beloved episodes like french mistake which is just basically they're almost like fan service episodes you know where you've got <laughs> misha mixing um you know his personal and his the version of himself and and parroting his um sort of fandom base and also his performance on Twitter. I mean, we could just, people could write theses on, theses, not feces, okay. Theses on um, <laughs> that episode alone, <laughs> sorry. Pearl of um, thesis for those who are not <laughs> Thesis, yeah, the, or, or reports. Um, yeah, and just even, you know, the various um, references that Dean makes, I think, you know, it's meant for us to identify with him. Um, I'm trying to think of ones that the that I know. What's that? The musical. Yes, absolutely. And ones that I know were ad libs by the actors, but I don't, I can't, I don't know why those aren't coming to me off the top of my head, except for the one where 
Jensen or as Dean basically threatens to cut um, Jared Sam's hair, right? <laughs> like, you know, you having been to a couple of conventions and watched some videos, the interactions that happen between audience and and performer at that sometimes get referenced in the show. Like I was thinking about Kings of Khan, right? If anybody, I know April probably has a lot more to say about that. Um, and the episode I think where you see this a lot is the episode uh, Baby, which is, you know, from the perspective of the Impala. And you see a lot of these things referenced. Um, you see the cooler, right, which has been become iconic for fans. You, you see uh, Dean washing the car in shorts, you know, and you see like some of that behind the scenes stuff, which I think was definitely influenced by by fan works and and themes that fans picked up on yeah and and in the musical episode dealing with the whole samulet uh, for those who are casual viewers that's dean's amulet that was thrown away at it during the whole apocalypse arc and then we find out later that sam did indeed pick it up out of the garbage can which fans knew from like right afterwards but the show didn't bring that up until many years later and um, that plays a huge role in fan fiction. Obviously it has its own name, but then he finally addresses it head on in the musical episode. And that is, is such a nod to, yeah, we know you guys are out there. April? Yeah, to kind of piggyback off what Tanya said a little bit with um, some of those episodes or like with Kings of Khan, which is a show that um, Rob Benedict and Richard Spate Jr., they play God and Gabriel on Supernatural, kind of did to poke fun at the, um, kind of at themselves, their whole theme is that they're famous like 20 weekends a year. And they recreate like things and interactions that have happened at the conventions with um, like very much extremes kind of of themselves, but they take those real things that have happened um, and make parodies of them and make fun of them. A lot of the cast are in the episodes of Jared Jensen and Misha are all in at least one and playing like Jared and Jensen are very much too cool to talk to Rob and Rich in that episode. They spend thousands of dollars on photo ops trying to pitch a show idea. It's very ridiculous and not totally representative of what's happening at the conventions. But I think in a lot of ways, the cast members have kind of done they've gone their own way in making fan art or taking inspiration from the fans and what the fans have done is kind of given them permission to kind of go out of their roles as just actors and do different things. There's a lot of podcasts now since the, um, since we've all been shut down, Rob and Rich have started a podcast as well. Um, a lot of Jensen going into music, Rich going into music, Brianna going into music. It's all kind of come from the fandom and from the shows that support they get from the fans telling them that yeah it's okay to kind of try these things i think they see the fans put themselves out there in that way and it gives them the confidence to kind of try to grow in different areas and their own way too and i think yeah. that a really interesting piece here is not only that the cast participate in some of these um fan works done by folks like Hollywood, where you've got so many of the stars and guest stars showing up in these parody videos and, and Jared and Jensen themselves. And then to think that we, the fans, can give the cast opportunities to grow as a way to say thank you. Jar uh, Jensen's growth with his music from being almost afraid to perform on stage to knocking it out of the park as a rock star and having his own album, and Jared bringing his musical abilities, which are substantial, uh, into a public place. That that that's scary, but there's a there's a wonderful sense of permission there that goes both ways. And I know at one of the conventions I was at, I was just floored. We it was uh, the Saturday night uh, concert, and we were doing um, they were doing the song Hallelujah. And the audience started giving it back call and response and just the looks on uh, Robin Rich's faces at 
recognizing they were receiving this gift. It wasn't just them giving to us. It was really, um, yeah, made me tear up. It made everybody else tear up too, but it was very, it was, that's unusual for Supernatural. That just doesn't happen in other fandoms. And God, it's why I love this fandom. Or Chuck, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it really is amazing. I was thinking as you all were discussing kind of Kings of Khan and these, these works or even that experience you're talking about at conventions, which I could get into my academic side. Um, but I was thinking about a mirror and a mirror, right? When you have two mirrors sort of overlapping and you look at the image in the mirror and it looks like infinity, like it, you can't see where that image ends. Um, to me, that really describes this relationship between fandom fan works and this show. It's layers and layers and layers, iterations and iterations of those interactions. There's absolutely no way it's not influencing each other. And I'm thinking about Gish, um, Misha's scavenger hunt, as a fund for Random Acts and the fact that he saw through these fan works um, what the kind of passion, skills, and incredible, some of these fan works are just, I don't even, I am not an art person. Um, so I, I write, but I, looking at these, you're just going, this is so amazing. And some of them are professional level, um, products, but he, you know, I think he's written about this. He saw the potential here and said, okay, what, how can we do use this to make a positive impact in the world? So I think doing charity work, um, doing activism in the last gish, uh, is the most transformative work you could you could have come out of this and to me that's the legacy that's the legacy of this show also the fan the friendships like april and i became friends and you know we've never met in person but we've known each other for three <laughs> or four years or something you know and and so it's just um those kinds of networks even my friends who have moved out of the fandom if you will or like are not active in the supernatural fandom most of my friends at this point are from those connections at some level. And it's usually supernatural. Well, and then there's also the Always Keep Fighting campaign, which also grew out of the the conventions and has led to like the peer intervention network and all of the supernatural casts messaging around mental health, mental illness, suicide prevention, depression, and, and Jared really taking a big role there, uh, daring to be candid about his own struggles. Uh, yeah, I agree. That is some of the most transformative works because, as I said, I've spent decades in fandom and I can't think of other fandoms that people regularly say, this fandom saved my life, like it happens with Supernatural. And that is the highest level of transformation. April, you've been quiet. Yeah, I'm just listening. Um, I, I do agree with Tanya there. I mean, it was definitely transformative for me. I'm in the same boat. Most of my friends, if not all, are from the fandom at this point. And it's very um, different. My friends and I talk about the difference between regular years versus con years, because if you, you can meet somebody at a con and you tell them those secrets that you usually, like, it takes three levels of trust. But no, we're, we all know each other's trauma the first, like, three days. It's, it moves a little faster with that kind of connection, but it's definitely, it, it is transformative. I've been fortunate to be involved with um, Random Acts and see some of that kind of firsthand, um, how it transforms not only the people that are giving, but the people that are receiving those works. Um, I've been involved with GISH too for I don't know how many years now, and it's, it's the things that we've made Jensen's face out of. I think it was Legos <laughs> last time. And it's, I, I don't have that ability myself personally, but <laughs> Skittles or seasoning or very um, odd things that you're not really going to see on Pinterest or Etsy anywhere that <laughs> people are making these portraits. But it has been um, transformative, not just for the fandom, but kind of as, and Tanya's done much more than I ever have as far as research on this, the, um, the social movement that has come from the fandom, their ability to kind of assemble and get things accomplished when they need to. And obviously that's been modeled by the cast, by people like Misha, who has an entire organization dedicated to changing the world through kindness and through campaigns like Always Keep Fighting. But the fandom have been very receptive 
to that and have kind of taken those messages out on their own and, and transformed those messages in a way too, I think. Well, folks, we are at the end of the hour. I know we could spend all day and it would be so much fun just hanging out here and talking. And um, we will be back with more panels, but thank you so much for being with me today. Um, April and Tanya, can you tell us where to find you online and, and how people can find your you know, works uh, that we've referenced? April, why don't you kick us off? Um, um Conventional Wisdom on, on Twitter is at SuperConWiz, April Vian on Facebook and Instagram, and my book is available on Amazon. Yeah, you can find me, Tanya Cook, and it's uh, just C-O-O-K is just spelled like normal on Facebook, or for more of Always Keep Nerd Fighting, which is our research project, it's at capital A, capital K, capital N, nerd, and then capital F, fighting. And we're also on Medium uh, as a blog where we write a little more in depth on um, what our book is kind of going to look like. So if you want a little bit digging into that, we just had one come out about Gish and the latest mini hunt. So. And uh, <laughs> I'm Gail Z. Martin. You can find me at gailzmartin.com or morganbrice.com, D-R-I-C-E. Uh, all of my other social media is of it is either those full names or the initials so i'm pretty easy to find and i run the supernatural team free will nc group on facebook come check us out that's tfwnc folks uh thank you so much for being with us today this has been uh, another installment in the supernatural fandom track for continual and we will be back with more love legend and lore with supernatural here at continual thanks so much